Hi and welcome to our lecture series on leading and managing change. This is part one of a two-part series. So where have we been so far in this course? We've spoke about the contemporary workplace and the history of management in our first couple of weeks just to give you an introduction to what management is and where we are today. We then moved on to our functions of management. Now our functions of management were planning, organising, controlling and leading and they are the things that underpin everything we do as managers. We then moved on to our management and its context where we've talked about environment diversity, international dimensions, motivation, ethical behaviour and leading and managing change is the one that we're finalising today. All through this trimester we have actually given you some learning icons which I'm really hopeful that has engaged you through this process in identifying what's a key definition versus what's a theory. These are just put back up here for your reference. So, let's talk about change. Charles Darwin once said, it is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones that are most responsive to change. And that's never been truer. We see organizations such as Kodak refuse to engage with this technological innovation that existed around them, and they never went virtual, and they um, almost died as a company. Then we see organizations such as Facebook really embrace this technology innovation and they've been highly successful in their market. We see new innovations such as Snapchat and Instagram enter that market and really connect with the younger generation. So change happens all around us. But as managers, what do we need to know about it? So in this series, we're going to start talking about change and how it applies to you as a future manager. In this particular part of the two-part series, we're going to talk about the forces for change and what we mean by change leadership. So what are the forces of change? Well, organisational change happens quite rapidly. We can have planned change or we can have unplanned change. But what is, non, uh, what is common to all types of change is that complacency is the barrier to organisational change. Right? So the rate of change is only expected to accelerate with new technologies and economic pressures to increase revenue and cut costs. However, not everyone is willing to accept and embrace change and that's where complacency comes in place. So we need to, as managers, understand what the forces and the targets for change are. So forces for change could be the global economy, market competition, local economic conditions, government laws and regulations, technological developments, market trends and social forces. So we tend to see all of this stuff happening outside of our organisation which we have no control of. But they impact us greatly. So for example, the global economy, what happens in the US actually impacts us here because it slows down some of our imports or exports. Market competition, if we're now competing in a global market, then we need to address some of our global competition. And that's important. When government change its laws, we need to respond. Now, sometimes they're just small changes, sometimes they're large. And there's a process for that, but it certainly addresses and hits us um, in an organisation. So in a planned change, which is one in which we expect, what we tend to see is that there's a target for change and that target may be a task, people, culture, technology or structure. And it really depends on what's happening to what the target is. So let's talk about planned and unplanned change. Planned change is a direct response to an uh, organisation's or person's perception of a performance gap. Now a performance gap is simply put as where I want to be versus where I am and there's that gap in the middle. Okay. So my discrepancy between my desired where I want to be and where my actual state of affairs are. So there's that big gap. Now if I want to achieve that, I can put in place a planned change approach. However, if that gap is told to me by outsiders and for example say I went to accreditation and I, I failed my accreditation because this, this, this or this may have been wrong, then I need to engage in an unplanned change exist, uh, process. So that means that um, it occurs spontaneously and it doesn't benefit any of the change agents. Okay, So it might have 
a strike, a plant closure, an interpersonal conflict, something's going to happen, uh, but I can't predict what's going to happen. So let's talk about change leadership. In organisations, we talk a lot about a change agent. And a change agent is simply put as anyone who takes leadership responsibility for changing the current pattern of behaviour. All right. So it's basically someone who says, yes, I love this change. I'm going to embody it. And I'm going to embody it and I'm going to go and be a change leader um, who is fo forward focused, proactive and embraces new ideas. Or I'm going to be a status quo manager. In which case I'm going to say, no, no, that's not how we did it in the past. This is how I did it and this is where I need to go. So I'm going to be more reactive and comfortable. All right, so a change agent is most likely going to be a manager. However, what they, they're the person that takes responsibility. And that change agent can either be a change leader or a status quo manager. So let's take a look at those differences. So if we're looking at a change leader over here, we've got managers who are confident of their ability. They're willing to take risks. They seize opportunities. They expect surprises. And they make things happen. And a change leader promotes and actively supports the creativity and innovation that's happening to make that change happen. However, on this side, we've got our status quo manager. So that's someone that's threatened by change, that they say, no, I'm not doing this. We have never done it that way. We're going to do it this way, and this is why. So this uncertainty of change really bothers them. Um, and therefore, they prefer this predictable pattern to the way in which they work, which means that they're more likely to keep going with the status quo. Right? So they'll wait for things to happen. And in this case, they actually end up avoiding um, and discouraging creativity and innovation. But by discouraging creativity and innovation, they end up being more complacent. So as a manager, your job is to work out which side of the continuum you want to be on. Ideally, you're on the change leadership style. So let's talk about change leadership. Change leadership has many models, and there's been lots and lots of theories done. I think at last count, there was over 3,000 models. But change can be done in multiple ways. So we can do top-down change, where senior manager says, no, I need to change this process. It's not good enough. I need to do X, Y, and Z. So by I need to do X, Y, and Z, that means you need to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and it's called theory E change. All right. So Basically, activities that are going to increase shareholder and economic value are going to be um, enabled. And I'm going to use incentives, restructure things and downsize to improve my financial performance. And I, that may cost employees greatly. It may even cost them their job. But ultimately, the job is to, from a top change down change, is to improve performance for our shareholders. All right. So... How do we do this? Now, we can lead large-scale performance cha transformational change through establishing an urgency for change. So basically, we go in one day and say, look, guys, we need to change. And we need to change because this is going to happen, this, 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 this. And therefore, we need to change now because this person over here is doing this and I need to be just on top of them um, to beat them to market for a product, for example. We need to form a powerful coalition to lead the change. So we need to find that change agent that's going to really champion what we're trying to do. We need to create and communicate a change vision. So we want to know where we're going to go, and we're going to communicate that. And we need to empower others to change. So it's not just good enough for me to want to change. Everyone wants to change. Right? And everyone has to change because that is what we're doing here. We need to celebrate short-term wins because often in organisations what we tend to do is we ask managers to keep implementing change after change after change. But it's never acknowledged that they've done that. So what we need to put in for our transformational change to happen and be successful is we need to actually celebrate those short-term wins and build on the success that they have already done. By keeping the message consistent, we're going to be more successful. So that's top-down change. And transformational change tends to only come from top down. Other change initiatives come from bottom up, and they're called theory O. <coughs> so when change comes from all levels within the organization, then it's and based on and activities that increase organizational performance capabilities, 
then it's called a theory O change. All right, so uh, we encourage participation from the bottom up. Um, and the idea is that the most successful change leadership that happens occurs with bottom up and top down strategies. So they meet in the middle. All right, so in this mini lecture, we've really talked about the forces for change. We know that we work in a global env um, environment and we know that what happens overseas impacts us. So we understand that the forces of change include the global economy, market competition, local economic competition, <coughs> government laws, technological developments, market trends and social forces. And we also know that change leadership really challenges the status quo and has to be led by both top-up down and a top-up process, bottom-up process for it to be 